Hi guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, I mean it is an over the top beautiful spring day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in the great state of Texas, a great day to be alive on this planet here at the very end of April 2020. I am Sam Mitchell and this is Collapse Chronicles and I'm going to do something that I have never done here in uh, two years on Collapse Chronicles and have a second uh, interview with this fellow Sheldon Solomon. Uh, I was, the, the first interview which I'm going to post here and encourage you to listen to part one because it'll make part two make more sense. Uh, it, it was so fascinating, and so in, in part one we talked mostly, we centered on the uh, coronavirus panic going on, and so this, in, in part two of this interview, what Sheldon and I are going to do, we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday, and we're going to look ahead into the 21st century as more and more of these uh, catastrophic uh, or existential threats start showing up at our door and how we're going to respond to that. So real quickly, in case you missed the interview yesterday, <clears throat> Sheldon Solomon is a professor of psychology at Skidmore College in New York. He's, his studies of the effects of the uniquely human awareness of death on behavior have been supported by the National Science Foundation and Ernest Becker Foundation. Um, <clears throat> Solomon is co-author of In the Wake of 9-11, The Psychology of Terror, and more germane to our discussion today, the book, The Worm at the Core on the Role of Death in Life. Uh, <clears throat> Sheldon received his doctorate at the University of Kansas, and his research interests include psychological function of self-esteem, and again, more importantly for this interview, the effects of human awareness of death on thoughts feelings, and most importantly, behavior. So Sheldon Solomon, for the second time in two days, come on and say hello to the gang, and we're going to dive right into this rousing discussion. Well, hello, everybody, and thanks again, Sam, for uh, having me back. Yesterday was uh, great, and I look forward to carrying on. Okay, so guys, just so you know, I, I Ted, Ted, I mean, <laughs> Sheldon, Several years ago, did an excellent, uh, did an excellent talk, a TED talk. I guess it's probably a TEDx talk to be concise. Yep. Uh, called "Humanity at the Crossroads," which was kind of like a twenty-minute summation of his excellent fifteen-page paper that we went into yesterday, titled. We think it's either death denial in the Anthropocene or death anxiety in the Anthropocene. So what I'm going to start with, I'm going to do a mashup, Sheldon, uh, of, of quotes from uh, the beginning of that talk and that paper. I'm going to read what you have said, I guess, five years ago, and we're going to see whether you still agree with what you said now that it's been five years down the road. <clears throat> okay. Very good. All right, here's the mashup. I am not sure that the future is all that auspicious. I believe that the future for humanity is frankly very bleak. It is entirely possible that we will have the ignominious distinction of being the first form of life to be directly responsible for our own extinction by rendering the planet unfit for human habitation. There you go. I think that right there, brother, is fodder for a fine conversation on Collapse Chronicles. 
Sheldon Solomon, why do you think we might have the ignominious distinction of being the first form of life to be directly responsible for our own extinction? Wow. All right, Sam. Well, I'd like to be wrong on this one, but the <laughs> argument that I made, I think it was five or so years ago in the Humanity at the Crossroads talk was that um, we're in a, a historically unprecedented confluence of uh, four problems that um, have existed in the past, but never at the same time and to this degree. So um, my recollection is that I started that TED Talk um, with one of my favorite lines from a Thomas Hardy novel. A uh, dead British guy who said, if a way to the better there be, it lies in taking a full look at the worst. And uh, so it was never my intent to just kind of brutalize people into a demoralized stupor so much as to, um, at the very least, make us informed observers as we witness uh, humankind extinguishing ourselves. But uh, I said, well, there's there's just four things that. Um, we should think about one is that um, we talked a little bit about yesterday, and that is humankind's um, annoying uh, disinclination to be able to peacefully coexist uh, with other people that uh, we don't consider to be part of our group. And I, I remember saying something along the lines that even the most benevolent glance at human history uh, reveals uh, an ongoing succession of genocidal atrocities punctuated with the with the brutal subjugation uh, of designated in-house inferiors. Uh, and, um, of course, we've always been beating the crap out of each other. There's clear evidence since back in the Paleolithic days that we are a very territorial um, uh, species that are, are happy to kill each other. Uh, but what we got today, uh, of course, in the 21st century are increasingly sophisticated weapons of mass destruction that uh, could, uh, you know, reduce the earth to a smoldering heap. And so we've got war. And then on top of that, as you know, even more than I, and so to do your listeners is the environmental uh, degradation and climate instability. Uh, and my annoying way of talking about that is to just say that only the willfully ignorant and intellectually dormant, of which there are no shortage these days, uh, will deny that human-induced climate change uh, has altered the Earth's environment. Uh, the planet will be fine. Uh, jellyfish, snakes, mosquitoes, cockroaches, they'll rock. And uh, maybe they'll put a human in a jar of formaldehyde someplace so the cockroaches can come see what we look like um, in the future. So we got war, we got environmental degradation, uh, and then we've got what I used to describe as the relentless pursuit and uh, mindless pursuit of money and stuff. Uh, uh, most of us are not content uh, with what we need. Um, rather, we have uh, just an insatiable desire to buy stuff on the Internet, or, or if not that, then uh, we're preoccupied with watching TV to see who can drink the most yak urine uh, on Survivor. And then when we get done, we hop into our SUV and over to Walmart to save a, a dime on a lemon and a chainsaw. And then on top of that, uh, we've got the fact that uh, America and probably other parts of the developed world at this point is just a petri dish of psychopathology. Um, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, we've got about 12 percent of the U.S. is currently depressed and uh, about a third of the adults in the U.S. will be depressed at some point in their lives. I'd probably argue half of us will be depressed at this point. And then we've got another 20 or so percent addicted to drugs and alcohol. And so well, we could probably add a few other problems to this <laughs> list, but that's sufficiently blunt to get us going. So we got war. 
degradation of the environment, mindless pursuit of money and stuff, and the fact that we're riddled with psychopathology. Well, we're certainly more depressed than we were 10 minutes ago before uh, you ever picked, I am, you yeah. ever picked up the phone. <laughs> I, I, I know I, I know that I know that I am much more depressed than I was. Uh, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Sounded like you just electrocuted yourself. I'm thinking, oh God, did, did he depress yeah, himself uh, so bad good. that that you that did you you electrocuted yourself? I knocked over my little stand. All right, now I'm ready. I've restored well, let my me, let, let me. Well, let's let's just go with that. This one for a, for a moment. This is just going to be kind of an organic conversation, All right. whatever. Now, I, I I will fully admit, people who know me, I have been severely clinically depressed uh, since I was 18 years old. I have been suicidal for most of my life, which probably has something to do with why I don't have death anxiety. That on uh, one, you know, uh, you need to study that suicidal tendencies and and, and death anxiety. Uh, but talk about your own depression. I, I mean, good lord! I mean, for for a man who just spent the last ten minutes reading us that laundry list of of ways humans could go extinct, are you depressed, Sean Solomon? And if not, why aren't you? Well, uh, so sure, uh, on the one hand, if I sit still long enough, Sam, to um, actually seriously consider what I just said, um, I, yeah, I'm pretty much uh, overwhelmed. Um, I get disillusioned and demoralized uh, really quickly, and... Uh, I think, and this may sound maybe ironic, or maybe silly, or maybe even moronic, but well, one of my defenses to ward off depression and anxiety is to think about what might underlie these tendencies um, as an academic exercise. And so I've spent the last 40 years um, studying the role of death anxiety in human behavior, probably in large measure to distract me from the actual fact of these matters. I don't know if that just made, yeah, made yeah, any yeah, sense. Yeah, I, I can understand what you're... And there's probably a little bit about that, what I, yeah, what I do with my own life, being the chronicler of the collapse of a... Uh, of a planet, but this, you know, you've heard that. I, I know, I know you, Sheldon. I've heard this. Uh, where did this come? Was was this Castaneda? Uh, who who came up with use death as your advisor? And, I think that was Castaneda. Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm, I, I'm, I'm just having a senior moment. I, I, because you know, all of these people. I, I always mix up Carlos Castaneda and, and Terence McKenna. I think it was Don Juan Matus. Yeah, always talking to Carlos about you know using death as your advisor. But what I'm talking about for people down in this rabbit hole is using the death of. An entire planet, or at least uh, the death of uh, of humanity and every species we share this planet with, as your advisor, and folks down in this rabbit hole, what we collectively refer to as the doomosphere. I, I don't know how every one of us hasn't committed suicide. Yeah, that's um, yes. So, but, but do you think many people are using the death of this planet as their advisor, or, or is the reason that so few people are is that obviously no one wants to think about this yeah. because it sucks? Uh, no, that's right. Now, of course, uh, given uh, these ideas, and we talked a bit about this yesterday, but you know, uh, our work's based on Ernest Becker, and, you know, he just said that uh, we're so smart that we know that we're here, and that makes us realize not only that we're going to die, but that we could get obliterated at any moment in time, and that we're embodied animals, That and that, uh, you know, the confluence of uh, those realities would 
uh, you know, just literally be too much uh, for people to manage. And uh, so what most people do is, is to, um, you know, just kind of blunt existential terror by embracing the cultural belief system that surrounds them as they grow up. And then uh, they can be comfortably numb, as it were, and make their way through life. I, I call the average individual and myself at times a culturally constructed meat puppet where, you know, we're marching to the beat of somebody else's drum. But I think the folks like you and maybe me and maybe your listeners, and this doesn't necessarily make us better humans, are either unwilling or or um, incapable or both uh, of um, comfortably submitting to the vision of the world that is provided for us by our culture. And we're sentient enough to see beyond the symbolic obfuscations of reality to partake momentarily of it directly. And um, so um, even if um, it's a, not a particularly pretty picture, uh, I think some of us are condemned to be realistic about it. And maybe that's why um, there's so few folks uh, that are looking at what's happening uh, with clear eyes. Yeah, talk about when you get, you know, in, in your own research, uh, now from here on out, guys, I'm going to be talking, I'm going to be addressing his excellent 15-page paper, Death uh, Denial in the, in the Anthropocene. Hopefully, we'll figure out a way for me to post a link to that on here. Talk about this... Uh, about how we go to extraordinary lengths, well, not only to deny our own death, but to deny our own, I love the word, animality. And just take a rip on, on that and, and, and how that manifests itself into how we treat our, uh, our fellow earthlings and the living planet. Yeah, um, great point. And... Uh... Fine question. One of the things that I found most alarming and arresting um, when I first encountered Ernest Becker's works uh, as a young professor in 1980 uh, was a little line he had in the book Denial of Death where um, he, he said sex and death are twins. And I was like, dude, you know, what are you doing? You've already ruined my life. And now the few things that I thought were fun, now you're ruining that. And, um, but his point very simply is that um, we uh, chafe at the prospect that uh, we're animals. And, and that's because um, animals are in nature and everything in nature uh, dies. In fact, it was the Scottish philosopher, the John Locke dude, who just pointed out that anything in nature is of finite duration. And that was probably the, the psychological impetus for the construction of the supernatural, you know, super nature above nature. And that's the psychological impetus for any form of dualism that tries to separate the mind and the body so your carcass can keel over, but you'll still be around uh, in the form of your soul. And so what, what Becker argued is that we will go to extraordinary lengths to deny that uh, we're animals. Uh, and in fact, in our studies, when we remind people of their mortality, sometimes by just asking them to write about their own death. Sometimes we do our studies outside of the lab and we stop people in front of a funeral parlor or a hundred meters to either side. Our thought being that if we stop you in front of the funeral parlor, that death might be on your mind. Or sometimes we bring people into the lab and while they're reading something on a computer, we, we blast the word death for 48 milliseconds. It's so fast that you can't even see anything. And when we do that, people that are reminded that they're going to die, they take vigorous exception to the idea that humans are animals. And 
when we remind people that they're going to die, they also find lots of bodily processes um, revolting, uh, things that would, uh, would, might be mildly disgusting in general, like <laughs> urination and defecation. So bodily waste products, when we're reminded that we're going to die, they get more repulsive. Uh, but so too does the physical aspects of sexual behavior. So even sex uh, reminds us that, uh, you know, we are fornicating animals, you know, running a lap around the track of life before we pass the baton on uh, to the next round of creatures. And not only that, but when we're reminded that we're going to die, uh, we become more uncomfortable uh, in nature. So we've got some Dutch colleagues that showed that ordinarily, if you show people a bunch of pictures, they like nature pictures more uh, and pictures of like New Jersey where everybody's got a lawn and a fence. But people that are reminded that they're going to die first, uh, they like the lawns and the fences and they're scared uh, about nature where there's no ATMs and no McDonald's arches. And so, uh, you know, in a proverbial nutshell, uh, it seems like uh, we become extraordinarily uncomfortable um, in our corporeal containers. I like the word animality also, uh, but we distance ourselves from animals. And, and I hope this helps us understand uh, why we're so summarily cruel to them. In fact, when people are reminded that they're going to die, uh, they have uh, less regard for animals. And they say that it's more okay to kill them for reasons other than food and medical research. Wow. And wow. uh, that, that, that sums up so much, that, that, that explains so much. And guys, what we talked about yesterday is, uh, so I, I, don't, I, I don't want to go off on a tangent, or I just want to let people who did not hear that sure. interview, what we talked at length about yesterday, what Sheldon addressed, was what we're, what's going on on this planet now with this 24-7 two-by-four bashing us upside the head, uh, uh, reminding us of our own death. Instead of 48 milliseconds of subliminal messages, what it's meaning, what, what, it's, what it could be meaning uh, to our psychology with, it, with 48 milliseconds turning into 24 hours, seven days a week. Uh, getting getting uh, death anxiety uh, aroused, uh, but anyway, so do go back and, and listen to that that interview. I, I wonder when, when I interviewed Derek Jensen last time, and, and, and again, I need to be careful because I should have made this question part of yesterday. When I would, do you know? Are you familiar with Derek Jensen's work? Yes, not as much as I'd like to be, but I'm getting there. Yeah, but, but his, his takeaway, his prediction, you know, we were kind of making predictions. His prediction that the end result of where, what's going on in the, this madness that's going on in the planet today, the net result is going to be that humans are going to, in fact, be more separated from nature and hate nature that we're, we're going to blame nature on this. You know, it's, it's those damn bats. It's those Absolutely. damn pangolins. And, and if anything, the, the separation between humans and nature is only ramping up uh, as we speak, not going the direction it needs to be. Do you agree with Derek Jensen on that point? Yeah, I am uh, completely on board, um, unfortunately, um, you know, I, it, it reminds me, I don't know if you, have you, do you know, um, John Updike, the novelist? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Been a while. So, I used to read all of his stuff. Yeah, me too. But, but, uh, and I, I'm just staring at this cause it's part of my evolutionary psychology class, but, uh, here's John Updike in the year 2000. He said, it seems that the human species is heading toward a planetary triumph as complete as that of corn in Iowa, the paved over and wired up earth will produce a single crop, people, plus what people eat, 
and there will be nothing left of non-human nature. What, and that's, what, I think, exactly what you were saying Derek was saying. Yeah, exactly. What, what, what book was that from? I, wanna... I don't know. I'm going to have to get back to you on that. I, it was like in the beginning of a chapter in a yeah. different book that I was reading, but I'll, I'll, I'll track it down. That's a great, that's, that's a great quote. John, John, Up, John Updike. Yeah, was, John Updike. That's cool. That's cool. Okay. Uh, well, so, so talk about the, the, the main way that uh, it sounds like a lot of what you were writing about, you, you write a whole lot about you know, both your research and, and your conclusions about how death anxiety translates into our just desire for all of this planet eating stuff and uh, just just connect some dots and, and, and how is being afraid of your own mortality how is that manifesting itself and the explosion of, of Walmarts all over this planet? Yeah, again, great question. You know, so basically, uh, you know, Sam has a, a, a haiku-like statement of what I think is going on in all of these circumstances. You know, these seem like um, when I did the TED Talk and I'm like, oh, we got war, we got the weather, we've got, you know, money and stuff, and we've got psychopathology and you know, those seem like four very superficially disparate problems. And our point is what ties them all together is that they're malignant manifestations of repressed death anxiety. All right. And so uh, back to Walmarts and, uh, uh, and McDonald's and, and so on. Um, it's... Uh, Again, um, the John Locke dude, who I suggest people read, particularly my conservative friends who pretend to be fans of his ideas. But one of the things Locke said is that, you know, anything in nature, um, it, it, there's an upper limit to how much we desire of it. Uh, to put it another way. All natural desires are satiable. So you might like apples, but after five of them, you're like, I've had enough. Or you like beer, and after 12 of them, you're like, I've had enough. Uh, pizza, uh, M&Ms, fill in the blank. Yeah. All natural desires uh, are satiable. And, and then Locke, he doesn't go much. He just kind of thinks about it in passing. Uh, but he said that there's something different about money and stuff. Uh, and he even says that what what it has that it has to do with the fact that money doesn't rot that it, it's potentially there forever. Uh, and what Ernest Becker said is that whenever you've got an insatiable desire, because after all, if you ask a rich person what are they going to do tomorrow, they're going to be like, I want more money. If you ask the average consumer who just bought something. Uh, what am I going to do next week was like, I'm going to buy something else. Uh, and uh, Becker argued that what underlies insatiable desires is our irrepressible quest to blot out death anxiety. And some of the older folks might remember, I like Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, the Tennessee Williams play. Yeah. And they bungle this one, but um, Big Daddy in the play says Her something. Her character. The, yeah, the human, um, the human is uh, animal is a beast that dies, uh, and if he's got money, he buys and he buys and he buys. And I think the reason that he buys everything that he can buy is that in the back of his mind, he's got the crazy hope uh, that one of his purchases can be life everlasting. And I think that that uh, really sums it up. And I, I tell my folks that. Uh, you know, if you if you doubt that, just look at the back of a dollar bill. You know, we're right in the middle of it. We got in God we trust. So here we are in a country that venerates the separation of church and state, but we never really meant that. And then there's the pyramid to the left side of the back of a dollar bill uh, with the eyeball on top of it. And that's an ancient Egyptian symbol of immortality. And uh, so sure enough, in studies that people have done, 
uh, when you remind people that they're going to die and you ask them how much money would you need to have uh, in order to feel comfortable, uh, they say that they would need more money. Uh, and when you remind people they're going to die and then you show them like commercials either on TV or in magazines for fancy shit like cars uh, and fancy watches, uh, people want, they don't want a toaster anymore after thinking about death, but anything that conveys high status, uh, they want that uh, more. And if you remind people that they're going to die, they want to be more famous. Uh, they'll even pay more money to have to own a star in the galaxy uh, after you remind them that they're going to die. And, and then one of my favorite studies is by some Polish psychologists and they showed that if you remind people that they're going to die and you just ask them to draw a picture uh, of money, they draw larger coins and bigger bills as if money is bigger when death's on your mind. Uh, and then the really, the, I find the most astonishing study uh, was by the Polish dudes. And, and they had one group of people and they just gave them a stack of money and said, hey, will you count this money? And then the other group of people, they gave them a stack of pieces of paper and said, hey, count these pieces of paper. All right, and then nobody gets to keep the paper or the money, but then a couple of minutes later, they measured death anxiety. And uh, quite astonishingly, just having money in your hands uh, was enough to reduce death anxiety. And so I guess the point that I would make, Sam, is that we in, uh, in, the, in the U.S. and in the West, we see money as just a rational medium that serves to help us exchange goods and services. And all of uh, classical economics is based on the idea that people are rational consumers, that if they had enough information about marketplace matters, uh, would make intelligent decisions uh, about what they want and what they consume. And our point is that that's quite nonsense, that money uh, surely does serve to regulate the exchange of goods and services, but it has always done much more than that, and it serves as a potent symbol of immortality. And so for us, uh, part of our insatiable quest for money and stuff it is, as Big Daddy put it, just this hope that if you've got enough stuff, then you'll be on the back of the list of the Grim Reapers uh, to do today. I'm just, um, I, I, I'm curious. Uh, not, I'm, I, I, I don't, I don't mean to switch switch out of uh, out of this line of thinking, but for some reason, when you were when you were talking about all this, I flashed on Edward Bernays the. You know the uh, public relations guy, the nephew of Sigmund Absolutely. Freud. Uh, are you familiar with you know a Century of the Self? An excellent, excellent four-hour documentary. I think from the BBC. Really do do dove into all of this stuff. Are, are you familiar with Bernays' work? And does yeah, you, we, does your yeah. research tend to pretty much bear? bear out what he was talking about on a similar line? Well, I believe so, because, you know, he was one of the first people to realize that the intent of advertising is not to appeal to people's rational sensibilities, but rather, quite the contrary, uh, to override them and to go right back to the brainstem yeah. and to appeal to our basis fears and our deepest desires. Which would which would certainly comp it seems to me would certainly complement your re it's, it's not exactly what you're looking at but it's certainly complementary and, and and adds uh, some some sort of uh, e evidence to to bear out what what Becker and and you were talking about is is that correct you would oh I think that's absolutely right and, and of course Bernays was working off of Freud's early ideas where it was all about sex and aggression and it still is to a degree but later Freud was much more starkly existential and then it became uh, all about uh, life and death and uh, you know I don't think it's a surprise therefore uh, that, you know, when you look at advertising and the kind of stuff that people want to have, 
uh, you know, it's either stuff that boosts uh, your reputation, that makes you look larger than life, or it's stuff that makes you look like you're going to live a whole lot longer than you might otherwise. And so we spend more on cosmetics in the U.S. than we do on feeding people and educating them. And we go to extraordinary lengths to obscure the fact that we're aging and we don't want to be anywhere near old people and so on. In fact, that's uh, what underlies uh, our um, universal efforts to cover and modify our bodies. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we're the only creatures that wear clothing for the most part and that have sculpted hair and, and tattoos and, and body piercings. Uh, and uh, according to this argument, that's a fairly um, obvious way to put some distance between us and the animal kingdom that we abhor by virtue of it reminding us of our mortality. Now, and, and, and obviously the, the ultimate of, of everything we're talking about here in the 21st century is the race to the singularity, the, the Ray Kurzweil's uh, of the world, you know, literally, literally wanting to merge humanity into machines and just completely get rid of the human body and yes. uh, t talk a little bit about uh, about your take on the singularity movement yeah. and well, well no with all due respect uh, to these very smart people and also noting that I'd be happy to put myself on the waiting list for that, so at the risk of sounding hypocritical, um, our view is that, you know, these, this is just a 21st century extension of humankind's desperate effort to avoid dying that goes back to day one. So uh, as long as there's been people, uh, we've been wandering all over the globe, you know, trying to find magic fountains or, or magic berries where uh, we can live forever. Remember Ponce de Leon yeah. uh, stumbled upon Florida. He was looking for the fountain of youth. And, you know, then you got, uh, you know, obviously the pharaohs and uh, the ancient Chinese burying themselves with their terracotta warriors. Uh, you got the, oh, in the, over in China, you got the, uh, alchemists trying to turn lead into gold in pursuit of the elixir of life. And so we, we've been working real hard, uh, you know, not to die for, you know, a long time. And then in the 21st century, uh, you got Charles, no, 20th century, rather, Charles Lindbergh worked with uh, his Dr. Carell, I believe his name is, in the 1940s and uh, 30s to um, to keep uh, cells alive uh, in perpetuity, yeah. again, just trying uh, to avoid dying. And now we've got cryogenics where, you know, you can, uh, if you got a shit ton of money, you can go have your head chopped off when you die and chill out uh, with Ted Williams um, in Arizona someplace. Um, and, um, but that's so still connected with the body. It Everyone so, you but, said, uh, I mean, but the Kurzweil yeah. gang, they take it to the next step. There you go. So they're basically going the Descartes way, you know, which is let's make this Cartesian dualism wrong. And, and they even refer to the body, <coughs> excuse me, Sam, uh, as, uh, you know, just an unfortunate uh, and a revolting mass of soon to be dead uh, and, um, you know, moldered corpse. They're like, let's abandon uh, that uh, and let's just upload ourselves onto some <laughs> giant computer cloud. Uh, and um, now, again, oh, I, I don't know, uh, you know, when we write about that, uh, we're just like, wow, uh, you know, I'll, we'll leave it to the philosophers to decide uh, what such an entity would be. You know, when we're being silly, what we say is, wow, you know, right now, most people, as soon as they do something, it doesn't count till you post it to your Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever. Yeah, but what's life going to be like when you are your Facebook page? You know, you're a, a totally um, virtual entity. 
Um, to me, I, I, I find that um, a sad concession to a death-denying delusion. Now, again, with all due respect to the people who feel very strongly otherwise, uh, you know, because they have a right. In fact, they've been quite vigorous in saying, all right, if you want to die, feel free to do so. We don't share uh, your desire to continue in the long line of formerly alive things. Well, good, good luck to them. Well, okay, we're going to move down to the uh, pretty much the last paragraph uh, to as we start to unfortunately getting near the end of our second interview in two days. And uh, th this, th this is basically what I usually eventually get to is turning this uh, freight train around at this point. And you start off that paragraph about how human survival in the Anthropocene, meaning now, will yeah. require coordinated efforts by cognitively nimble and emotionally intelligent individual and state actors willing to explore a variety of political, economic, economic technical, and religious approaches to fostering a sustainable future, and that this would be a tremendous challenge even under ideal conditions but under the conditions that we're in now, good Lord, and, 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 and just add on the conditions in the last six weeks. Brother, yeah. is there any way that, that we're going to turn, uh, I mean, everything you mentioned in the next sentence, there are reasons to, to <coughs> say there's no way in hell we're turning this freight. Every bit of the evidence is contrary to any uh, hope that we're going to turn this freight train around. So run with this one for a while. Yeah, well, all right. So here's one of these where, uh, once again, I, I would prefer to be wrong. Um, <laughs> but uh, I fear that, um, that I'm not, nor are folks uh, who share this view, um, we are ironically in a moment in time uh, where the problems that currently befall us are not manageable by any of us individually yeah. or frankly by any individual entity be it corporate or state and um and so uh, and moreover uh, there's a, an evolutionary psychologist that dude that i'm fond of his name's joseph henrik and he wrote a fine book called The Secret of Our Success, and it's about cultural evolution. And the point that Henrik makes is that, uh, you know, we as humans are basically cultural animals. And the only reason we're alive today is because we're the beneficiaries of tens of thousands of years of accumulated cultural knowledge. But most of us are blithely ignorant of why it is that some of the things that we do are actually effective. Uh, and so the, and then Henrik goes on to say that humans are really crappy uh, at designing any kind of intervention. Uh, and, you know, so history is uh, quite clear uh, that whenever you have even a well-intentioned idealistic person who says, oh, you know, it, let's fix the world, let's do this, or let's do that, uh, rarely have things gone well. And what Henrik pointed out, and this is uh, five years ago, before any of these problems were as salient as they now are, is what we ought to do is be willing to entertain the possibility that there may not be any singular, unequivocally effective solution to any of our problems. Um, so you know, uh, you know Bill McKibben's work, um, where he writes about that we're going to only be able to live in relatively small and yeah. sustainable communities. And then who's the whole Earth guy? Is it Stuart Brand? Yeah, I believe so. So and then he's like, no. Uh, the only hope is that we move to cities and. and have nuclear power, but then 90% of the earth will lay fallow. 
And so these couldn't be more superficially and mutually exclusive. So you go one, you got McKibben saying, we've got to really scale it back. Uh, you got Stuart Brand saying, no, I can imagine that the world would consist of like 10 or 15, you know, Uber sized Tokyo, Buenos Aires, Manhattan type things. And, and my point is that um, how will we know except if we try a, a number of options? Uh, and but the but the problem, not to sound uh, doomsdayish in the doomosphere, but I don't think we've got the time uh, to do that anymore. Uh, I do think we're on the cusp of a wholesale collapse. You know, as Jared Diamond and others would have it, and. You know, if history serves, it, it might, it shouldn't surprise us if we're not far away from a world that's pretty much been reduced to rubble, you know, with maybe 10 percent uh, of uh, our current population of humans uh, left. And while that may seem pretty dire, um, my cautiously optimistic view is if that's what it's going to take. Uh, for us to consider a just radical reconception of what it means to be human, what's important and what's valuable, uh, then the only hope and the great value, I think, of what you're doing and the kinds of things that your listeners think about is that, well, all right, if the proverbial shit hits the fan and most of Earth is eliminated by virus, starvation, war, mental illness, or any other mishap, well, then the hope is, is that those of us who remain uh, will possess collectively a sufficient body uh, of knowledge, knowledge of uh, natural reality uh, that is a function of particular local environments, but also a knowledge of these broader conceptions of what it means to be human, uh, and what it is that drives us, because we're not going to have a fundamental change in human evolution, in my estimation. People are always uh, going to be disinclined to die and always yearning to seek uh, ways to feel meaningful and valuable. And so I think the question ultimately is, are we going to be able to work out ways for life to be meaningful uh, and to do so in a fashion that doesn't ultimately result in the destruction of other people in the world in which we live. Well, then this that this is the question. Uh, clearly, that this is the the question facing humanity. It's the biggest story on the planet since we climbed down from the trees. People get sick of me repeating that. Well, do you, you know, I know but the thing, Sam, is if they are. Well, that's fine, uh, because at least I am in agreement with you that at, right now there are no more pressing questions. And, and even if annoying, um, a lot of people, myself included, need to keep hearing it uh, until we're willing uh, to seriously engage w with these ideas. These are not, in my estimation, uh, demagogic. Uh, ideological contentions uh, so much as uh, a reasoned intellectual stance about what's happening around us. And, and you know, this may sound naive, but uh, my hope is that the, the best thing that can happen is that these ideas get in wide enough circulation uh, to encourage uh, respectful engagement and civil disagreement. That, that's how ideas um, are advanced. It, it's, it's not like, uh, you know, just who can piss higher on the pole. The whole notion of civil disagreement, we, we talk a lot about that yesterday. We don't need to get into it, but that has become an oxymoron in the last six weeks. Uh, that's right. Civil disagreement. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, now, civil war uh, is my is not quite the oxymoron of, of civil disagreement. Yeah, I'm uh, afraid so. It's it, it, it's gone out the window. So anyway, in, in your TED talk, I I, I noticed uh, in, it was 21 and a half minutes, 
you spent, if you're not aware of this, you spent in 21 and a half minutes, you spent 20 minutes and 45 seconds t talking about how doomed we were, and you spent less than 45 seconds trying to sound uh, hopeful at the very end. Yeah. And that was five years. That was five years ago. Do you can you find forty five seconds of a Hollywood ending to put on this this two part interview, which has gone on uh, close to two hours? Can you give us yeah. forty five seconds of? Uh, yeah, of, sure. So here's my elevator speech in right. terms of a hopeful conclusion. <laughs> Things are dire, uh, but uh, humans have a great track record historically of extricating ourselves from serious difficulties once we understand what underlies them. So, you know, basically, you know, we had the plague um, and people were dying. And as long as we thought that it, it was the result of, um, of evil spirits, you know, nothing happened. But uh, then we figured out that it was bacteria. And once we did that, uh, well, then that led to the discovery of modern medicine. And, and so, uh, again, even if this is naive, uh, my argument is that if we could recognize the role that death anxiety plays in human affairs, uh, maybe we can, you know, uh, get off the bench, as it were, and deploy our remarkable ingenuity to find ways uh, to counteract the destructive effects of these basic fears. So, you know, I like Albert Camus in his notebooks. He, he said, come to terms with death. Thereafter, anything is possible. You know, probably a little overstated, but why not set the bar high? I think he's onto something. Well, do you... Do you do you believe he is or not? Let's get let's get brutally honest here, brother. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, really <laughs> this is honest. The last uh, no can do, but all right, we could at least. Uh, again, I want to sound cynical. We could try or pretend to try. Okay. Now, uh, I have I have saved this question. I, I I do not know the answer to this question, guys. With all of the studying I've done on this man. I have never asked this man I'm getting ready to ask. I do not know the answer to the question. Sheldon Solomon, are you or are you not a parent or a grandparent? Uh, I am a parent. Uh, I've got two kids um, and a bunch of pets and some trees and plants. So, yes. Any grandchildren? No, not yet. Not, Our not kids deep. are in their early 30s. Uh, we're uh, we're agnostic. Uh, it's if it would make them happy, we would be delirious. If they do have kids, yeah, if they do, and if they don't, we don't see uh, the quality of our lives depending upon snippets of our genes persisting <laughs> over time. We're, but we are big fans of life in general. Okay, we're just going to leave it at there, guys, because we could go off onto another hour, but good Lord, we have done it again, uh, Sheldon, twice. And so you, you, you know, because you just went through this yesterday, uh, if you were not talking to uh, Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, where you had 60 minutes to to drone on, uh, but you actually had the mainstream media sticking a uh, a microphone in front of your face. Sheldon Solomon, on the last day of April 2020, give us your 60-second message to humanity on your way out of here. Well, all right. Well, uh, you know, my 60-second message is that it's completely contradictory with everything that we've talked about, Sam, and okay. that is that I still, um, I love life. I think humans uh, at our best, even if it, we, it is only an occasional lapse into humanity and at our very best, are still capable uh, of uh, noble and heroic deeds and aspirations. Uh, I think that maybe uh, we're, none of us are going to be able to change the world, but it doesn't mean, I can't remember what that Indian did, I think it was Krishnamurti, everybody wants to change the world, but nobody wants to change themselves. And so how about if we all start uh, by looking in the mirror 
and thinking about how we could be kinder and more decent humans. And let's hope that that's as contagious as the virus. There you go, brother. That's one of the great 60-second closures. So anyway, again, stick around for just a couple of minutes after we wrap up. But guys, both of my batteries are, uh, both of my camera batteries are flashing. We're getting ready to have a collapse of civilization here. So real quickly, uh, again, this is Sam Mitchell. This is Collapse Chronicles. If you enjoyed what Sheldon had to say to you, by all means, Please uh, go over there and spend a few seconds to thumb up this video and let Sheldon know how much you love him. And for what it's worth at this point, please do subscribe to Collapse Chronicles to help make up for the over 200 subscribers I have lost in the last two or three weeks. Uh, <laughs> anyway, and Sheldon uh, Solomon... Uh, one more time, we really appreciate you taking a second hour out of your busy schedule to come talk to us at Collapse Chronicles. More importantly, we really appreciate what you've done with yourself for the past 40 years, and keep up the good fight. Thank you, Sam. It was my pleasure. Have a great day, everybody. Bye, guys.